Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to Today in Bitcoin. Today is February the 6th, 2017. And today we have a very, very special guest on the show. All of you in Bitcoin land know who this guy is. His predictions are legendary. He is a famous entrepreneur. Right now, he's in charge of Civic, and he'll talk about that at the end. This is the legendary Vinny Lingham. Vinny Lingham, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Legendary, right. not, not it, quite. <laughs> oh, man, your, your, your predictions are legendary. I mean, they're, I, talk, I use him as a reference so often on this show. Everyone knows that. So the first time I heard Vinny speak was actually in uh, Cape Town, South Africa in 2015. And one of the intriguing things that he said, he, Bitcoin was down at the time. And he was talking about different industries. Certain industries need certain raw materials or they cannot function. Certain industries need silver. If there's no silver, that's it. They just cannot function. And he was wondering, what is, what's Bitcoin going to be the raw material for? Do you, have you come up with an answer to that question yet? Is Bitcoin going to be the raw material for an industry? Well, I mean, I think it's the digital industry. I think we, we it's becoming a raw material for a lot of um, interesting applications. Um, you know, there was obviously a, a question about whether or not you could use other chains and other types of cryptocurrencies to perform certain tasks. And I think, you know, as we see, there's a lot of security issues, concerns, pump and dump schemes. You know, all, all, I tell people, altcoins are a great way to buy Bitcoin because you basically pump up the price of the altcoin and then trade it for Bitcoin. So everyone should start an altcoin, um, add it to it and go, great. And when the price speaks, then you just bail out of the altcoin and get Bitcoins. So I think that, that happens a lot, as we know. Um, the reality is that Bitcoin has got some very fundamental, unique things about it. Not all altcoins are bad. Some are, they're very, there's some special purpose ones, which are, I think are very interesting. But as a rule, I think you'll find that the one will become kind of the gold standard uh, and then the rest will be, you know, specific use case base. And so the, the answer to your question, I think, is I think that we already have use cases. And the real question is, how long will it take for the demand for Bitcoin for you know, industrial for business usage? Um, how long will it take for that to sort of ramp up? But right now, the biggest demand for Bitcoin is, as I think, as a store of value or as a hedge against uh, uh, emerging market currency issues under the new administration, etc. So speaking of increase in demand, another thing that I love that you brought up in uh, one of your most famous uh, articles was uh, that you feel eventually governments are going to get into a buying war in regard to Bitcoin. That governments are going to start buying up Bitcoin and once another government finds out, then all the governments will want to buy Bitcoin. Can you get into that? Are there any governments that you suspect might do it first? Has it already started? And I think you said it might happen around the 2017, 2018 time frame. Is that a good time frame? Yeah, I, I think it's. I think personally, it's, it's probably already started on small scale. The problem with government buying is that governments can't buy enough coins to to make it significant for them without moving the market uh, in a big way. So I, I'm sure smaller governments have probably bought small amounts. And and I think as as people start looking at diversifying treasuries and and you know, cryptocurrencies, it seems like an interesting area. How much they put in right now, I don't know. But the real, the real issue is the strategic part of it. So if one country buys, what is the other country? You know, it, the moment someone pulls the, the trigger first, you've got over you know, 150 countries worldwide. Well, you, know, you get a bit of a FOMO going on at a government level. It becomes interesting, especially if it's China buying bitcoins and Japan wants to control bitcoin. I have, have skin in the game. Um, it would be very interesting. I think it's going to play out definitely in the next two years, hopefully uh, probably this year. But again, it's, it's, there's some there's a nuances here. Wow, so FOMO with governments. That's that's great. Now, talk. Speaking of the future here, um, Litecoin is trying to implement uh, and altcoins. You brought up altcoins before. Litecoin is trying to implement segregated witness. Um, I think it'll pass eventually. What are your thoughts on that? And then, will that lead to Bitcoin implementing it? And do you support Bitcoin implementing segregated witness? So this is a very hot topic. I mean, I've, I've been pretty open about my views on this. Um, I think that we should do SegWit uh, as, a, as an intermediate step. And I think holding back on SegWit is actually it's a bad thing uh, for many reasons. I think a hard fork is the worst thing we can do right now for Bitcoin. 
because there's no doubt it will create an orphan chain and that orphan chain will be tradable and it will create confusion. So when people go to um, a website and want to buy spending Bitcoin, is it Bitcoin original versus Bitcoin classic, whatever. Okay, it's going to be a problem. And so now you have to have two payment mechanisms on the site and the, the site owners are going to be you know, saying, well, we'll stick with the, you know, if BitPay or the payment processor, we're going, to, we're going to stick with the main chain. That's okay, but now people are going to be confused because people who had the previous coin, this is going to be a, a, a you know, a, a, a massive effort right now. So I, I think we've got scaling concerns. We should all rally behind um, uh, SegWit because it, it prevents a hard fork and it prevents us from being in a situation where you've got a marketing crisis around Bitcoin and a consumer. We already have crises in Bitcoin. Like we don't need more. So let's just please go with a soft fork. If it doesn't work or it's not getting us there, then fine, we'll look at a hard fork. But for now, a hard fork is, the, is like the nuclear option. We should not be looking at that right now. Yeah, the, the hard fork is splitting into two. I think we've learned our, I thought we learned our lesson from Ethereum. I mean, th there's the example, there's the case right there. And it, it seems like you, you bring up if, if, God forbid, there were two Bitcoins, people would be very confused. It would be a marketing disaster. Is mm -hmm. there a lack of marketing knowledge in the cryptocurrency space? I, I just get this feeling that Business skills. people are oblivious to. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. the lack of business skills, marketing skills, economic skills, psychology skills. Um, there's a, a general lack of understanding that we're dealing with humans here, not machines, uh, for the other half of, of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And so you, you cannot make these I mean, this is just, I think, I mean, I, I've had conversations with the, the major people who are, you know, Roger Bear, who are trying to push for uh, blocks. Like, look, I, I think it's a good point. We should have a block size increase at some point. But... It needs to be well thought through. It needs to be planned. It needs to be given notice a year in advance. I mean, everyone needs to have some sort of consensus around it that there's not going to be a soft fork, uh, sorry, uh, that an orphan chain formed. That, but we can't get that done in any reasonable space of time right now. And the reality is, the simple reality on the hog fork debate is there is a debate. And the numbers are split. And because there is no consensus, broad, broad consensus here, it's going to result in, a, in, in an orphan chain, no matter what we try and do. So... Is that so? It's not for me. It's not even a question anymore about whether or not um, you know the technical side of it is irrelevant. Actually, it's it, you know whether we can or should or whatever. It's like if we fork it, it's going to have an orphan chain, and if we have an orphan chain, what are the the call of the business or economic or ecos, you know, ecosystem ramifications of that, and how does it um, affect the Bitcoin price? How does it affect? market confusion. There's so many things to consider here. It's not as simple as just forking. I mean, I've, I've said we should either fork regularly or never. <laughs> so either you have a plan in place that you're going to do, a, even if it's a single character chained on a fork, you will fork at these intervals and people kind of agree that they will be with, um, you know, a part of that, that forking schedule, or you just never fork unless it's an absolute emergency. So you've got to, you, and so right now, I think we've already walked the path far enough where we haven't had a hard fork in a long time. I'm not saying it can't be successful, but it cannot be rushed either. Okay, very, very good points. Let's move on. You're from South Africa originally. Um, you have a lot of insight. You're Right now, you're in California, correct? That's correct. Uh, all right. So, but go, going back to Africa, I traveled around the, the southern part of Africa quite a bit in October and November. A um, lot of potential there. I get contacted by people in Angola just today, just they want Bitcoin. They don't know how to get their hands on Bitcoin. How, how should we approach these countries? There's not much Bitcoin in Zimbabwe, in Angola, in Namibia, uh, or, or Mozambique. Uh, the technology, people aren't that technology skilled in certain levels. It, 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 there's potential there. How, how should we go about this? Is there is marketing involved? What's, what's, what's going to have to be done? To get, because there's some eager people out there, but there's just a disconnect, I feel like. So Bitcoin suffers from uh, a fundamental, you know, dislocate, dislocated viewpoint from, you know, so in other words, everyone's got a, Bitcoin is trying to be, so if, if you had to sum up the views of the entire Bitcoin community in one view, it's trying to be all things to all people. Okay. And so that's an impractical situation right now for us because this is where the different ideologies break down. Some people want to be able to pay for coffee with it. Some people want to use it as store value. Someone want to use it for money transfers. Someone use it for identity like Civic does. Um, you know, we all have different perspectives on what it can and should be used for. 
but so I think this is this is the problem because the way it's a decentralized system, there is no um, there's no real governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do we fix this? Um, I think we need to understand that there are different viewpoints, the different players, and 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 different risks. And I think that to the extent what 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 the core team have tried to do right now is kind of it's kind of the right thing to do in the short term. And it's basically let Bitcoin do what it does um, really well and keep you know keep the, 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 the limit limit so focus on scaling like SegWit and keep the number of different applications of Bitcoin limited for now until we can get past a certain point. So it's, it's what I, you know I'm not saying that that core is doing everything right. I think there's a lot of things that's going wrong, but I think that the, the current vision that Bitcoin needs to just focus on what it does right now and, and just execute using that and get scaling and, and fix bugs and, and improvements, etc. It's kind of the right path to go for now. Now, does that mean, so, so when you look at the block size debate, yes, you can't buy cheap coffee. Well, do we need to? How big of a problem is that really? You know, you can talk about the disenfranchised market. Well, you know, how many of them have smartphones or technical savvy? If you look at the UX of Bitcoin, it's horrible. People don't understand 0 .004. Like decimal points past, like two decimal points is just, humans struggle with this stuff, okay? So now yes. we, there's all these other things we've got to fix up to enable coffee or whatever it is. Is it, uh, consumer adoption of Bitcoin is not going to grow rapidly if they have to actually deal with, you know, uh, these addresses which are, you know, effectively just long strings of numbers and letters. And it's, it's, this is not, this is not practical, okay? So what is practical right now? Um, and they call that level one, level two solutions, etc. So I think right now, we just focus on level one. Let's just get this thing working. Let's make sure it's highly secure. Make sure it's tradable. Make sure that the exchanges are running. People can use it as a store of value. And I, what I've said is my, my, my one post is that Bitcoin goes from, I think it's a more of a tweet than anything else. It was a, a phase one is, is really a digital commodity. Two is a store of value. And three is a currency. Okay, and so let's let's just keep and maybe those aren't the right ways to define it, but those, like it's just a framework. And I'm open to others, but I think it's limited, it's valuable, it's it's uh, it's got a you know a, a use case, and and there are miners out there producing it, etc. So it's got a supply, etc. So it, it's got a decent um, quasi digital commodity sort of view. Then the phase two is how do we make this a store of value? And a store of value really means that. It, you, you put money into Bitcoin, you buy something, and the price is not going to drop the next day or the next week or the next month. It's going to go up gradually. I mean, my post after that was make Bitcoin boring again. Like, we need to have slow, steady growth, and it is, there's a steady amount of demand for this. People misinterpret, like, the transactions on the network. I mean, they're not always good. I mean, just because someone buys in one place, transfer money, and sells in another place, it doesn't mean it's a good thing that you're buying and selling Bitcoin. The market gets affected. So the, the buyers on the one side, the sellers on the one side, and then you swap sides as you do the transaction. So you'll buy coins in one country, you'll send it in another country, and then you go back and appear. That doesn't help Bitcoin. People misunderstand. Like having a, I wrote this in my, my post like three years ago, but the you know, Bitcoin, um, what is it, the finding equilibrium post, where these, these ins and outs don't make a difference. You know, people's buying and selling coins. Like, how does it help? Having more merchants accept Bitcoin. Who cares? So, because merchants, merchants accepting Bitcoin really are ways of people selling Bitcoin because you're effectively selling through the exchange uh, when they exchange it for, for fiat. So, I think we need to focus on understanding that that as a payment system, it's just too nascent right now. There are some good use cases, and it's possible to use it as a payment mechanism right now. I'm not saying it's good, but it's just not something which is mainstream. What what I like to focus on is industrial use cases for Bitcoin that makes Bitcoin a real store of value because industries need it. Companies running identity ledgers, companies building, um, you know, uh, supply chain um, pro you know, products around blockchain, etc. Like these are the things which make Bitcoin valuable. And so we should try and get to the point where people want and appreciate that you can go put some money into Bitcoin and it's going to be there in a couple of years time. And I'm not one of those crazies who go, oh, well, Bitcoin is safe for your money. I know you can drop 20% in a day. We all do. Everyone in the industry does. But people who, yeah, and yes, you can argue for the long term, but unless you understand someone, uh, every, unless you understand an individual's unique financial situation, you may, you may not appreciate that a 20% drop in someone's um, bank account effectively can actually you know, either bankrupt them or make them not pay their rent or whatever it is. You can't use it as a store of value for people who are living day to day. And so it's, it's not stable enough for what people want it to be, which is a currency for small. Small payments, etc. We need to have, 
you know, we need to have more um, ways to hedge. I mean, if you want, if you really want Bitcoin to grow in, in, in price, and you have a situation where merchants are holding onto the Bitcoin and saying, you know what, we'll just hold the coins and we'll maybe buy a hedge uh, on on a you know on CME or something, and they can hold the coins long term. But selling it back into the market doesn't help the price. I like buy and hold, buy and hold, and make Bitcoin boring again. Let's let's try to do that. Now you touch you touch on the overall economic situation on this uh, planet. You talk about it a lot in some of your blogs. You comment on all sorts of economic things, and I will link to all of his important links below. And there are a lot. But what do you, what do you think about the people out there that are just you're you're a bullish guy, I think, on Bitcoin at least. But what do you think about these economic doom and gloomers that? sell fear porn and just promote World War III all the time. They kind of blend in the big, they kind of enter our world sometimes. They go in and out of the Bitcoin world, but we're, we're always encountering them. Uh, what do you think about that attitude and that, that mentality and how that affects just what's really going on in this world, I guess? So, you know, I think you should be, everyone should be very careful when dealing with anyone selling something. <laughs> Because like, think about it, just human nature. If, if I'm selling gold to you, I'm going to tell you about how gold is the best thing ever. It's going to protect against crisis. I'll show you. You, you, can, you, know, you can always make up facts or you can always show um, trend lines. But unless you understand, have deep insights into the industry and, and underlying reasons. I mean, people point to the gold price rising over you know, the past uh, whatever, decade or so. And they forget about the fact that you know, uh, the central banks got together and agreed not to sell gold more than, you know, more than a certain limit of per year. And so, well, isn't that a factor? <laughs> so b people don't understand how to read charts and numbers very well. And they don't understand how underlying factors can, can distort things. So look, a lot of Bitcoiners are big onto gold. I'm, I'm bearish from gold. I think gold's gonna end into next year, 2018, 700 to 800 range, maybe even lower, who knows? But um, yeah, I'm bearish in gold for lots of reasons. I think there's a bit of a, um, a yeah, it doesn't look like it, but, but the thing about it, the, the same people who are selling gold at 1800 saying gold is a store of value, the world's falling apart, you have to buy gold, they, they're wallowing now at 1200 when you're down 33% on something which is supposed to be a safe hedge against you know things going crazy. Um, again, so people selling gold, like I don't sell Bitcoins, <laughs> it's not my business. I, I, and I give, what I tell people is I give reasons for how I think macro uh, events will play out. So. You can, if you buy my reasons, then you say, oh, actually, he's right about that. Then this is the impact it should have. It's a ball. I'm just saying, look, this, this is the reason. It's like cause and effect, right? And so when I, if I write, this is the potential effect, and I could be wrong about those things. But typically, if I'm right about the cause, I'm right about the effect as well. So sometimes I say, well, I'll make an example of a cause that doesn't happen. Happen. Well, that didn't happen. Obviously, the effects aren't happening either. Um, and I, I don't have any ideological sort of, you know, uh, firm viewpoint or anything really. I like I I avoid labels. I had a conversation with a friend last week, and I said, you know, he he labels you know, he labels himself a bit of an anarchist. And I said, well, the problem is that when you give yourself a label, you tend to have to draw on those um, on those viewpoints as a default instead of you know maybe being. Well, I'm open to not being an anarchist today, right? And so, what does that mean? So, so I think the more we label ourselves as, as libertarian, Democrats, Republicans, anarchists, the more we basically are saying we subscribe to a set of doctrines, even though all those doctrines may not be applicable at any one point in time. So, saying that I'm a gold bear isn't true, and saying I'm a, a Bitcoin bull isn't true either. I mean, I've been, I've given reasons why Bitcoin would go down and go sideways, and I've written multiple posts where it's not always up, and so. I think that we need to be very careful of how we look at things like cause and effect and look at the underlying reasons and have more data-driven uh, viewpoints and philosophies on, on predictions. And uh, again, even the best predictors, like you, you'll say it's 70% chance. So you know there's seven out of 10. So it's all about what are the probabilities of, of this happening versus that happening. And that's the way you, you kind of have to, to play the game. And, and so, yeah, I think, again, just to answer your, your, your question, when people have a certain viewpoint and a certain uh, bias, listening to them is a bad thing because it means that, that you are not thinking, well, first of all, you get information which is biased, and then you're not thinking clearly because if you have that same bias. And it's more important to have freedom of thought than to say, I am this or I am that. Or, so I, I, you know, when people ask me like, what political affiliation I have, I have, I have none. I have an affiliation to humanity and figuring out what the best thing to do for the world is, you know, for, or in any situation for myself. Or my family, or whoever I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making a decision for. And so, yeah, the, don't 
you know, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of, of being a free thinker as opposed to subscribing to an ideology. Exactly. I, I like that. Think for yourself. Don't rely on some magical robot on the internet to tell you what's going to happen and plan your life around. So finally, tell us about Civic. I, I like Civic. I signed up right away. Tell us what's going on and what it's all about. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're a very early seed stage company. I think we spotted an opportunity to use um, the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain particularly, but it's actually the technology is agnostic, um, as, a, as a universal ledger, which can store um, uh, not the actual identity information that you may have, uh, but effectively confirmations that you own certain pieces of information. And think about it this way. If, if, if you have a piece of information about yourself, whether it's your name, your birthday, your, your social security number, your, your driver's license number, whatever it is, if there was a way of proving that you were the owner of a piece of information by using cryptographic keys um, and using an independent ledger to, to, to assess and verify it without storing that data, you could actually create a pretty interesting global system around um, ID verification. And so that's what I'm that's kind of what I'm working on right now. I'm building a company that does um, effectively identity management, but, but realizing that the blockchain is just an, an underlying piece of technology. It's, it's like Linux. It's like an operating system. And so can we build interesting consumer products that use the blockchain? And make it uh, um, make it you know something which is globally scalable. So early stages, we have some exciting new products and announcements coming out. But it's something which I think uh, it's more about just the passion for 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 the technology. I think and, and and being able to say, can we reimagine the way the world is? I mean, ultimately, could we use a blockchain to vote for uh, you know a president of a country using your phone and using the tokens? And the answer is yes. I think we can. The path there is going to be really rough. Um, but the technology does serve and, and will actually work. But so we, we decided that building an identity layer first is more important because um, the actual mechanics of voting is easy, but and making sure identity works is, is the tough part. So that's the challenge we took up. Wow. Well, I'm going to link to Civic below. I'm going to link to all of Vinny's links below. Vinny Langham, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure. I think everyone enjoyed it. I hope you can come back in the future. I'll keep on promoting you, talking about you, because I love the way you think. It, it, I learn a lot from you. So, again, thanks for being on today. Great. Thanks, Adam. Take care. All the best. All right, everybody. I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you like this type of video. We're going to have other big guests coming on soon enough. So get psyched. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.